this left the, the inland side of it rather vulnerable to, to attack, you see. And to remedy this serious problem, they dug this huge gorge behind it in solid rock. And I mean, I rather think using the, the natural cleavage of the rock and iron wedges and big hammers, they shifted an immense amount of material. And without a shadow of a doubt, it's a wonderful feat of engineering and rock removal. And this is how they did it. First of all, they got an hammer and some form of a drill, and then they proceeded to drill it all in the, in the rock. When they're all sufficiently deep, you, you then insert a, a pair of slips, or some people call them feathers, or two lumps of iron down the hole. And then, a big iron wedge which you insert between the two metal plates and this of course has a nice sliding action when you beat it with the hammer you know and, and opens up a great crack and off will come a, a great slab of uh, rock hopefully we'll get a big lump you know As you can see, it's not as easy as it sounds. Not brought a big enough family. <laughs> I don't know about building a wall, but there's a few more slates for the roof. <laughs> really, that was partially successful, but I think they'd have had bigger and better tools than what I've got. <laughs> but I still wouldn't like to have done that all day long, would you? We know a lot about the construction of Edward I castles because they kept very detailed records. And here at the Public Records Office, I've got David Carpenter to tell me all about them. What this is, it's the account of the controller, the person in charge of the money at mm -hmm. Harlick, really for 1286. Mm -hmm. And it's extraordinary because it actually gives you a wonderful picture of the numbers of people working, the different rates mm. of pay. Mm. So you see very helpfully in the margin, mm. they actually told us who the various craftsmen mm. were with these little sort of lines. Mm. Cement, mm. masons, mm. QRR, quarriers, people mm. digging the great mm -hmm. ditches, my namesakes, mm. the carpenters, mm -hmm. then you've got the smiths, then you've got these, this is what I, where I would be, not you, Fred, mm. the minuti <laughs> operari, the labourers. How much sort of money did they get for the labourers? Well, the Royal certainly tells us that, and it's mm. very, very variable rates. So someone skilled mm. like you, Fred, mm -hmm. might get three shillings a week. Mm. So yeah, shall really. I pay you for that then? Fred? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Is, I, I'll be the controller. <laughs> mm. And let's scatter some 13th century money mm. around. Mm. How much do you think you're worth? Well, I'm, I'm a top rank mate. <laughs> you're sure, you're sure <laughs> about that, are you? You're sure you're not yeah, one of these made, little labourers? I made six well, storms today. <laughs> if you were a, a, a mere labourer, you'd mm -hmm. be getting one of those, and mm. possibly a half. But mm. you think you're better than that, do you? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, well, look, we'll yeah, tell you what, yeah. we'll mm. give you your five pence a day. As a top mason, you. you keep that safe and don't mm -hmm. spend it in the Harlick pubs. Mm -hmm. hey, and would there be an pub. air allowance as well? Wouldn't I fear not. No, no you'd oh. have to spend your own. Actually, that's a fascinating thing yeah. about all this, that you couldn't, <laughs> because this is so valuable, I mean, if you mm. think of, if that's, a pe that's the only currency, mm. Mm. Um, you, you couldn't actually go into a pub and mm. buy yourself a drink mm. because the money would be worth too much. I mean, mm. that's a day's ah. pay. Yeah. Mm. So you probably had to do that by barter. Yeah, I suppose from this document you can actually tell how many men, you know, worked at, at any period in time on the Yeah, you actually castle. can, and it is very, very seasonal building work, I suppose, then mm. as now. Oh, aye. Probably. If we go back to when this role was begun, in a very, mm. very cold January, you see there's actually only one mason working. Mm. He mm. seems to be doing a sort of special job. Mm. And then suddenly, Sunday, mm. the 21st of April, Mm. to Philip Rum mm. and Thomas Del Meded mm. with 29 masons mm. and then their pay. So suddenly a gang mm. of masons mm. has arrived mm. under Philip mm. Rum. 
Mm. But that's only the start mm. of it. Because if we go on, on into July, spring and summer, spring and summer, lovely and warm, they've got 225 mm. masons yeah. working. Yeah. So it's gone up by about 200. Mm. It's like another thing you've got to think about: the, the constant threat of the enemy. <laughs> Well, well they, course, they, they, once right. they'd got it up so it, it could be defended, yes. they, you know, they could go off and do, do one somewhere else. In this very tense period, you sometimes get workmen being moved from mm. one part of Wales to another under armed guard. Very, mm. very tense yeah. and dangerous. And I should think I'd be jolly pleased to be one of those workmen to get out mm. of it yeah, at the end yeah. of the year. <laughs> Take my little pouch yeah, of yeah, money yeah, home yeah, and get back to where I come from. most impressive of King Edward's castles was Carnarvon, because here what he built was more than just a castle. Edward decided that Carnarvon was going to be the centre of his administration in Wales, so the castle here would be his royal palace, a symbol of English dominance over the Welsh he had just defeated. Carnarvon is built on a spot very close to the old Roman fort of Sagontium, which, of course, had connections with the famous Roman emperor Constantine, who were a bit of a rebel, really, because he captured, in the end, the Roman Empire with a British army and, of course, was responsible for building the city of Constantinople. When Edward decided to build Carnarvon, he got Master James, his chief architect, to purposely mimic the stripes on the, on the walls of Constantinople. The castle would be the HQ of his English empire, right in the place that the Romans had theirs. Work began here in 1283, when Edward was still at war with the Welsh. Here once stood a row of houses that it took 20 men a week to demolish and get rid of the timbers and the debris. But they still made a bit of a mistake. They only brought the walls up at this point to about 12 and 20 odd feet. Edward really relied on the strength of the town walls to keep the enemy at bay. But in, in 1296, they broke through, the Welsh broke through. And of course, this business of 24 foot here were really no opposition to them at all. You know, they soon gained entry. So once the revolt was put down, they increased the height of these walls and the King's Gate was built to guard this entrance. Over here on my left is all that remains of the once great hall. If you have a close look at it, you can see the holes where the roof timbers were. And then round this corner here, a lovely plinth or scutting board at the outer edge, which would of course would have followed the bases of the buttresses and round corner right up to the other corner. I suppose there'd be a, a lovely window frame somewhere in the middle there. And really, once this particular bit must have been a beautiful building that's now gone. It's rather, rather sad in a way. The layout of the castle was not the only defensive feature that Master James designed. As you can see, in between these two big towers, there's a quite a short length of castle wall. This wouldn't have been able to be defended properly by single arrow loops. So Master James came up with an ingenious solution. He did these like three entrances all into one. So if you imagine three crossbow men, like one stood here firing that way, twang, and then another one up here, twang, and then another one down here, like twang. It'd be like all that crossfire down below. Like the enemy looking up at the walls would just see one slot. And he'd, he'd imagine if he stood in between these two slots, he'd be safe. But he wouldn't. He'd get caught in a deadly crossfire like a medieval machine gun. But to really understand the castle's defences, you need to go up the Edel Tower. From up here on top of this tower, you can really see how Master James's defences worked. Over there on that side, we've got the sea, and over here on this side, we've got the river, deep and wide, you know, which would have kept the enemy at bay for quite some time. And then, through here, we've got the castle itself, which, of course, has got two lines of defence. Once had a great wall across the middle, which, of course, somebody's knocked down, so 
one big cattle now, but in the olden days it used to be 